Welcome to the Copeland Coaching Podcast, where it's all about turning your job search into a slam dunk. Your host is Angela Copeland. Welcome to the Copeland Coaching Podcast. I'm your host, Angela Copeland. On the phone with me today, I had Michael Diedrich Chastain in Asheville, North Carolina. Michael is a psychotherapist, an executive coach, and an organizational consultant at his firm, ARC Integrated. He's also the author of the book, Changes, The Busy Professional's Guide to Reducing Stress, Accomplishing Goals, and Mastering Adaptability. Michael, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Angela. It's a pleasure. Well, I am excited to talk about this because I speak with job seekers every day who are looking to find a new career and a new job. And very often, like when you sort of dig deep about why are they interested to make this change, <laughs> mm-hmm. it's because they're actually going through some something at their current job that's changed, that's difficult, and that they're having a hard time with. And so from your perspective, just based on your experience with clients, why is change so stressful for us, especially at work? Yeah, I, th- I think for a number of reasons. You know, I, I think at its core, change is really challenging because it disrupts safety, right? So I think that, that that's, a, that's a question at, at a core level that we're always trying to answer is, am I safe? Are things predictable? Do I know what's going to happen? And uh, whenever there's a change professionally or personally, it, it, dis- it disrupts that certainty. So I think, uh, I think that's certainly a reason. And then, you know, of course, the, the logistics of things, you know, you can't underestimate the, the stress of, you know, being able to pay for the mortgage and support a family and taking care of, of what you need to take care of. And so that's another reason. And then finally, I think that this is, this is maybe the, the biggest piece is that managing change as a skill set is not something that we're taught. I don't think that we're explicitly educated in how to move through a change process. And I do believe it is a skill set that we can become better at. That's really interesting. You specifically mentioned safety, and I've never really thought of it quite through that lens. I think that's a Mm. really good word, safety. I'm thinking, when you think about it, I guess sometimes the changes that we experience at work that are the most stressful are things like we got a new job, like a new boss, uh, Mm -hmm. or the company got a new CEO or uh, a lot of people were laid off. Um, And you're right. Those are all things that potentially impact our safety. Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, when we look at research based on um, team performance, for instance, or even executive performance, one of the predictors of high level performance is psychological safety, specifically when it relates to groups. And so I think the research is there as well to support this idea that, the more safe we feel, the more effective we are. Ooh, that is really interesting. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Well, so, and I'm, I'm going to dig into that some more, I think, as we go on. <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> That's like, I'm going to really hold on to that, I think. Um, okay. Well, so if we are going through something difficult at work, say we did get a new boss or there is a new CEO or a bunch of people are being laid off or there's a, you know, a reorg happening and we're going through it, like if we're sort of looking at ourselves in the mirror, so to speak, what are some signs that we maybe aren't handling it as well as we could be? Yeah. So a few things come to mind, you know, one is just the the simple element of just looking at our behavior. So things like how, you know, how are we coping with stress or, or in this case, you know, a change process, are we, you know, are we eating too much? Are we going out too much maybe drinking too much, you know, sleeping not enough or sleeping too much? Are we ignoring our physical health in some way? So I think that, you know, some of those behavioral things are easy to point to. Um, I also believe that, you know, we can, we can tap into a certain intuition that tells us, you know, are we, are we living in a healthy way or not? And so I think there's a part of us that might know if we're coping in an effective way or, or if we aren't. And if that's, if, you know, if intuition is not something that someone has really worked with a lot, I think that the other real simple tool is getting feedback. And so I, you know, in, in, in our work with, with teams and leaders, you know, we see feedback being such a, a game changing uh, perspective to get. And that could be from colleagues. It could be from uh, peers, from mentors, from folks that you're leading. Um, so asking the question, you know, how am I being perceived, I think has a, uh, has a lot of fruit on the other end of it. Mm, that's a good recommendation. It seems like if we ask for feedback, maybe we should 
either be very sure that we trust the person giving it or maybe ask a couple of people. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Yeah. So I, I, uh, one of the tools that we utilize is, is called the uh, 360 assessment, which I'm sure a lot of your listeners are familiar with. And so this is a tool that does exactly that. It, it gathers uh, feedback from a wide variety of folks in our sphere and then gives us kind of a report back. And, and 360s can be for a variety of reasons. They could be for leadership, they could be for stress management, and they could be for uh, communication or a variety of other skill sets. But absolutely, to your point, there's value in having kind of a large sample size. Yeah, because I think sometimes sometimes you might talk to one person and they, man, they just give you some spot on advice. But then you talk to like a second person and they just totally miss the whole situation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I think it's okay to get advice that maybe isn't applicable as long as you're aware. Like if you have a filter, um, I know for me, like I'm really good at like I can filter feedback very, very well. Like I I know what to take and what to kind of throw out. Mm -hmm. But I think you have to be careful about it because sometimes you just get advice that's totally going to take you in like a different direction. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. You know, and I think there's value in... um being specific about what we're asking for, right? Right. So in the context of your question, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's just that we want feedback in, you know, how do you, how do you see me managing this stressful situation? So we're real kind of granular with what we're asking for. I think that can be helpful as well. I think you're right. And you know what else is I know for myself, I've gone through some stressful situations and I felt like I was handling them terribly. Like I just Mm. really like thought, man, I am not doing a good job at this. And then I had external people say to me like, man, you are incredible at handling this stressful situation. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. I've felt that way too. Yeah, abs- absolutely. absolutely. So sometimes talking to other people can sort of also be really positive and reinforcing what you are doing that's so good. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, I think generally we, we tend as human beings to underestimate our resilience and and to your point, you know that that's a way to to kind of tap into some of that resilience is to get that positive feedback from others. Oh, that's great. Well, so let's say we we are struggling <laughs> to cope with yeah. the change. Uh-huh. Um, you mentioned a couple things to watch for. What are some things that you kind of recommend in general that we can do to help us cope better? Mm-hmm. So one of the one of the things that. Uh, I think is, is the answer that no one likes to hear when it comes to stress management or managing difficult change process is that there is that the tools that are available in the midst of it, in my experience, are less effective than the proactive strategy, right? And so, so what I mean by that is that, you know, there are all sorts of tools that we can use to manage stress. We can, we can meditate, we can journal, we can, you know, we can get involved in, in physical health, we can eat better, all of these, all of these things that, we, we kind of tend to know about, but in the midst of, of things, in the midst of a stress reaction or a difficult change process, implementing those strategies is going to have less impact than if we already have them implemented into our life regularly. And so my, my kind of more difficult, but, but longer answer is, you know, to have a daily practice of some sort that is a way to take care of ourselves, to manage, manage stress, stress rather, on the regular so that when there are times that are challenging, we're already prepared. Mm, That makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, as you kind of mentioned some of those things, the thing that you kind of talked about initially was, you know, eating right, sleeping enough, these kinds of things, especially sleep, I would say for me is is a huge, huge factor in my ability to cope with stress. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, I'll just share with you what I do. Yeah, I'd love <laughs> to hear I'd love it. some feedback. Um, I actually use like a Fitbit and I track my sleep at night and I sort of see the trend over time. And if I'm going through a stressful time in my life, I'm I'm really careful that I need to try to get an average of like eight hours or more of sleep. And mm-hmm. I'm able to just use tracking to sort of hold myself accountable in a way that I think otherwise I might just sort of you know, completely fall off. (laughs) Um, Yeah. But I don't know if you recommend tracking as like a, a way to, to work on some of those things. Yes, absolutely. I think that it's funny that tracking comes up quite a bit when, when we're working with clients. And the reason, the reason that is Angela, in my experience is that, and sleep is a good example of this, you know, for some people, the ideal might be seven and a half hours for other people. It might be nine, right. But we're not going to really know that unless we're diligent about, you know, 
tracking not only what we're getting, but what is our experience when we're getting various levels. And so, and I, in my experience, you can do that kind of tracking and evaluative process with any kind of behavior change. As it relates to sleep, though, I'll, I'll give a quick resource. There's, um, there's a great book called Sleep Smarter by Sean Stevenson. Are you familiar with that? I don't know. Tell me a little bit about it. Yeah. The, the reason I referenced that is because I'm, I am not a, a sleep expert, but uh, in this book, it's, it's really excellent in giving very specific strategies on how to um, optimize sleep. I think, he, I think he refers to it as uh, sleep hygiene. Mm. And so it's, it's packed full of research and really applicable tools. So for folks that um, really want get to a, get a handle on, on their sleep hygiene, that's the tool I would recommend. Yeah, I love sleep hygiene is a big deal. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. You know, figuring out like what temperature is the right temperature for you in the bedroom, what, mm-hmm. uh, you know, making sure that the windows are really dark and there's no, you know, LED lights around. Like there's so many things you can do and it's amazing what a difference it makes with your sleep quality. Yeah, yeah it's kind of funny that something so simple has all these like complicated elements to it. Right? <laughs> right? I mean, I don't remember it being that hard when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, so you mentioned having a daily practice and that uh-huh. makes me think of something that we often call self-care. And yeah. so often when I read about like stress, it just it says things like you should take better care of yourself. You should do more self-care. And, and also it's very trendy on things like Instagram. Like you look at, you know, photos of people, they're out doing self-care and it's, but it's very commercialized almost the way it comes across. Mm -hmm. So like help us understand what is self-care? <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's kind of funny. I think there are a lot of misconceptions about it. Um, you know, one, I'll give you an example. One of those might be that, you know, if it's Friday and I'm going to, you know, watch Netflix and order a pizza, that that's self-care. And so I think, it, and then just, just one example, I think of the difference between, you know, being passive and being active in taking care of ourselves. And so in my experience, Self-care for it to really work, meaning for it to keep us energized and keep our stress low and to keep our you know, ability to be effective in work and life high, self-care has to be very intentional and it, it has to be for the purpose of uh, kind of fueling us, right? And so something passive like watching TV and eating pizza might not actually energize us. It might just be a way to... Um, a way to a way to kind of not do anything, and there is a there is a differentiation there, and so I think you know practices like you know meditation, uh, mindfulness practices, sleep hygiene, like we talked about, uh, certainly good nutrition, um, you know physical activity, and it's interesting. All of these things, even by themselves, have a ton of research to show how they impact things like focus and attention and productivity and ability to communicate and all these other factors. And so um, that's the other thing that I'll mention is I, is I think that uh, sometimes self-care is thought of this, it's thought that it's this woo-woo kind of, uh, kind of practice, but in reality, there's a ton of science behind it. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. The other thing I think that's good for self-care often can be social support. And, Mm, you know, continuing to reach out to friends and loved ones when we're going through a difficult time. Because I know for a lot of people, we tend to kind of want to back away um, when things are going bad because it's just too uncomfortable. Um, Yeah, I I think one, I I love that one, one element that I'll add, you know, and this, this is another way to think about how we're caring for ourselves is evaluating the kinds of relationships that we have and asking ourselves the question of, you know, is this relationship you know, life giving or toxic in some way. And that's a really, those are really hard questions to ask. But, you know, I think a lot of times we can have people in our lives that are draining and that could be, that could be professional, that could be personal. Um, but either way, that has an impact on our ability to be effective in our life. And so asking those difficult questions, I think there's a lot of value in that. Mm-hmm. It makes sense. So the one other thing too on this whole self-care topic <laughs> that, yeah. that I have been sort of following lately, I'm curious to see what you maybe think about this. I had a doctor point out to me that when you're going through a stressful time, it's a good time that if you take probiotics, take a few extra. And mm. I know for me, because like gut health is just so important and I'm starting to see things you know, online about how it can also impact your mental health, like that they're starting to think it's connected. Mm. Um, And I know for me, I made it through the last year or so taking a lot of probiotics and not ever getting sick. (laughs) So there you go. um, 
I don't know. Have you have you followed that at all? Yeah. So I'm. So I'll say I'll say the disclaimer that I'm not a doctor. So this is not medical. <laughs> right. Medical. Sure. Um, but but I will say that um, part of my background is working as a psychotherapist and have worked in the mental health world for a number of years and. I have read a lot of the research and they, they are saying that the microbiome of the gut is uh, this kind of the second brain is what I've heard it uh, been called. And so um, meaning that, you know, what we put in our body has an impact on our psychology, on our emotion and stress and so on and so forth. And I, and I also think we're at the, we're at the beginning of what's to come as far as what we understand about that relationship. Mm -hmm, totally. And even things like eating breakfast. I know if I don't have breakfast, like, well, I, I eat breakfast every single day because it's not even an option. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know, eating breakfast and the breakfast has to be protein because for me, that's what I need to focus. Um, yeah. You know, being in touch with your, your body in terms of not only just like the idea of eating healthy, but what does that look like for you? Because I think it's different for different people. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's another one of those, you know, evaluative processes that we can look at when it comes to behavior is, you know, what does, you know, the various things I put in my body, the nutrition that, that I'm feeding myself, what resonates and what doesn't. And that sounds like such a simple question. And I think that there's that a lot of us don't ask that simple question of, is this thing that I'm putting in helping me or, or making me feel stagnant or heavy or lethargic? You know, asking these questions is really helpful. Well, it's like if you have children, you know how crazy they act when they eat certain foods. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you but, can. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't have children, but I, I've seen them. <laughs> yeah, right. And, uh, you know, I mean, as adults, we are still going to be prone to these kinds of things. It might just be more subtle at some point. Sure. Sure. Or, or, you know, or we've, I think sometimes the, the reality is that we've become less in touch with our body, less mm -hmm. in touch with the relate, you know, how, how we're actually feeling because, um, I think sometimes it's just in the busyness of our lives, something that is, is discounted and it makes sense. We're all very busy and we have, you know, a lot on our plate. So I, I get it. Yeah. Well, so when I'm talking to folks that are looking for jobs, you know, they're coming in and they're really frustrated. A lot of times they want to talk about sort of the problems that they're experiencing at their current job, the changes and the stress and the way that it's impacting them personally. And I totally understand. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times when we're going through that and we're processing all that information, it be, it's like we're at a crossroads. We're trying to decide, should we stick with it? Should we ride it out? Or is it time to move on? And, you know, when you talk to folks, like for you, where's the line? Like, how should we decide whether to write it out or to stick with it? Yeah, gosh, I think that's such a, that's such a hard question. You know, I was at a, um, it's kind of interesting. I was at a, an, an event this morning that was, it was a professional development event for a local organization. And we had a, a speaker there and he was talking about basically this question of, you know, how, how to decide when to leave and what are the influencers? And, you know, the complexity of it is that there are so many influencers, you know, there's, there's not only what I want, but if I have a family, there's the consideration of my partner and maybe children, or maybe there's, you know, sick parents involved or, or whatever, all the, all the various kinds of complexities that can exist. And so, um, I have some thoughts, but I wanted to, I wanted to give a little bit of a disclaimer that, uh, this is a really hard question to answer. And, uh, so not to underestimate the complexity of it. That said, I think that, you know, asking this question of, you know, is ultimately the environment that I'm in kind of the kind of the question of evaluating the environment, like we were just talking about a few minutes ago, is my work environment filling me or draining me? Is it ultimately helping me reach what I want to reach in my life professionally and personally? Or is it making me stagnant or maybe even reducing the likelihood of getting me where I want to want to get? So I think that's an important question. And then I also believe that understanding the, the internal versus the external. And what I mean by that is, you know, the internal is what's in my control and what isn't. And for those things that are out of my control, asking the question of what can I shift in myself that might be able to just change my perspective. So sometimes I think it's not about changing our environment, but it's about shifting something inside us that allows us to, to shift how we see it. And then externally, I'm thinking about how can I influence my environment in a way that I have not done yet? So I think that's a really important question to ask. And then finally, the, the final question I'll say, 
that is important. It's asking ourselves the question, am I, am I staying out of fear, comfort, genuine interest, or something else? So I think really diving into our true motivation is a, is a valuable question to ask. Oh, that's helpful. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. I think the other thing too, I often bring up when I talk to job seekers is if it is an abusive situation too, because mm-hmm. I have, there's one example I'm thinking of in particular where the boss in this example of this person, the boss was throwing things at work and was yelling uh-huh. and screaming and was really sort of volatile. And it was so upsetting to this person. They were crying and they were, I mean, it was really pushing them to like a really bad place and it, and it was abusive, you know? Yeah. So I think, you know, that's something to consider. Um, cause if, if you find yourself in that situation, but what I would say too is, so I'm probably, I may be a little bit more of a job switcher than you. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't know. I've had a lot of jobs. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> But I tend to want to encourage people to start looking for the new job, like when they start to get the sense, like this isn't where they want to be anymore, especially if they've been there for a while and they've kind of gotten, you know, as much as they're going to get out of it professionally, Mm -hmm. um, you know, to at least consider it. Because what I hate to see is a lot of times people will know it's not quite right. They try to make it work. They know it's not quite right. They try to change something else. And they wait to look for a job until they're literally ready to quit and walk out the door of the existing mm. job. Yeah, and, you know, that's a great point. I think it takes a lot of your power away um, whenever you're sort of feeling like your back is up against the wall. Uh, so I think yeah. not always trying to make everything work. It's good to make things work. But you know, um, when you see a bigger problem, like listen to yourself. Yeah, I totally agree. You know, I think any any kind of dis- decision is more difficult. And I'm sure we've all had this experience when we're in like a panic mode. And so, yeah, to your point, if we can start to make a shift or start to go down the path of a decision before we get to that point of, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm trapped. Then yeah, it serves us to a higher degree. Absolutely. Totally. Well, like, let's say we've decided our current job is just not the place for us. And we've decided to look for a new job. You know, we're talking about stress. Looking for a job is one of the most stressful processes. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Applying is hard. Interviewing can be hard. Getting rejected is hard. Um, you know, answering questions to your friends and family who can't understand why you don't have a job yet is stressful. <laughs> right. Like right. the whole process for most of us, even at its best, is stressful. Um, mm-hmm. And it lasts for an unending amount of time. Like you'd never know <laughs> if it's going to take two weeks, two months or a year. Like it's, it's just, it can be really difficult. And, you know, when we're in the middle of our job search, we can also feel really alone. And I'm curious from your perspective, when we are facing this kind of stress from our job search, what can we do to manage it? Yeah. It's interesting. What's, what's kind of coming up for me as we're talking is, uh, this, this parallel, uh, between the the job change and the stress management. So to your point, you know, one of the ways we can intervene with, with a job change to make it more fluid and, and, uh, let's, let's say healthy (laughs) is, is to start it before we think we have to. Right. And then the parallel that I'm, that I'm picking up in our conversation is that that's kind of the same thing we were just talking about in the stress management practice is not, finding the thing once we're stressed, but having that daily practice before we need to. So it's funny how these two things are, are the state, the same strategy applies. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's one thing to keep in mind. And then in addition to that is really evaluating, um, our environments, you know, not just the who that's around us, but you know, the where we are, what kind of communities are we spending our time in? What, you know, what kind of things are we doing online? What are we, what kind of information are we taking in? Um, you know, where are we at on social media? The reason I bring these things up is all of these environmental aspects influence our stress on a daily, on a daily basis. So I think really being cognizant of, uh, the what, who, and where we're surrounding ourselves with can be really helpful. That's, you make a really good point. Um, I mean, it, it can be, it can just be so tough. I think another part that's really, really stressful about the job search is that it's usually a secret, (laughs) 
Yeah, that's a great point. Gosh, I didn't even think of that. Of course. Yeah, of course. I mean, and it has to be a secret, right? Like we can't Mm -hmm. tell people at work because we might get fired. (laughs) Yeah, gosh. It's like this big burden that we're sort of carrying around that other people don't know about. And and honestly, like we're sneaking out of work and stuff too, which is almost like a whole separate topic. But yeah, um, yeah. I mean, what do you recommend about that? Like feeling so alone because it is kind of like the secret thing. Yeah, that's such a great point, Angela. I think that, um, you know, having someone that you can confide in, in the process will be super helpful. And maybe that's a family member or a partner or a close friend, or maybe it's more than one person that you can not only talk about, you know, I had a great job interview or I really bombed this one or whatever it is, but just regularly talking through the process. And to our point earlier, getting feedback, you know, asking people, you know, how, how are, what is their perception of, you know, how I'm going through this change process? Maybe through that, you know, we're able to gain some insight that we wouldn't have, you know, wouldn't have otherwise. So, so I think it's both, it's, it's support in the difficulty, but it's also maybe some feedback to create a smoother process overall. Oh, I like that. I like the idea too of multiple people. Cause I think Mm -hmm. sometimes you get to doing so many interviews, uh, your one person might not always be available. Um, And, you know, maybe picking someone who lives in a different city would be smart. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a great point. That's a great point. So it doesn't like get around someone who's not in your normal rotation. <laughs> uh-huh. <Yep. laughs> of, of I, friends. Like I also really like the the recommendation about feedback. I think that's, that's really a good one. Um, it makes me think back. There is a client that I worked with early on who I've actually interviewed for my show. And he, his job search was quite long. He switched. He was in higher education and administration, and he switched to working um, in. He works for a, a large hotel chain at their headquarters in corporate strategy, mm. and it it really took a long time. And I remember him coming to me. I don't know months into his search and saying, "This is taking forever. I'm so upset. Like, what is going on with my life?" Kind of a thing. Sure. And. I said, well, you had this job interview and they wanted to give you an offer. But he said, well, it wasn't enough money. I said, right, okay. Well, you had this job interview and they wanted to give you an offer. Well, it wasn't the right industry, right? Okay. (laughs) And it was like, but so we're actively making choices to continue to search, um, to find the right thing. And it doesn't mean that our search is going badly. It means we're making a more conscious decision. And especially when we're young and we're looking for a job. Sometimes we're just looking for any job in any city, doing anything for any amount of money. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> we just need a job. <laughs> and we, we forget because essentially, and so often we switch from career to career because, you know, our friend at our old job called us up and said, hey, I'm, you know, I'm looking for someone or I'm mm-hmm. moving to this new place and I'm looking for someone. And we just said, yes. But when you go through the process, like what you see with people that you coach, they're making a more conscious decision and that takes longer like because you're not just waiting for someone to pluck you. Um, Yeah, absolutely. And and I imagine that in the work that you do, you're also helping folks evaluate what are the strengths and gifts that they have that could be applicable to an entirely different uh, career. And so I imagine that might take time as well. Is that is that fair to say? It's true. It the the more thought you're putting into the whole thing, <laughs> yeah. and the more different that your new job is going to be than your old job, the longer it's going to take and the harder it's going to be. You're going to mm-hmm. get more no's if you look at it as like a probability. The probability of a no is much higher when you're making a switch than when you're doing the exact same job in your next job. Sure. Um, so it's just preparing yourself for that, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. Well, so let's say six months go on, go by and we eventually get a new job. <laughs> Things <laughs> finally worked out for us and we're so excited. We think finally the stress is going to stop. And then we find out that even though we got this awesome job, we're still stressed because we're going through change. And even though the change is good change, it's still stressful. So mm-hmm. what's the deal with that? Why is good change <laughs> su- stressful too? Yeah, I think it's it's funny because it's whether it's good or bad, it's still uh, unpredictable, right? And then at the root of it, the stress comes in because again, this question of safety and this question of do I know what's going to happen next? And the more that we can have an understanding of routine and expectation and safety, the 
the more, you know, the, or the less stress we, fe- we feel. And so unfortunately, that's also the case with positive change. There's still this element of, of uncertainty, right? And then again, I think, you know, understanding how to manage change uh, as a skill set is, is again coming into place. And in my experience, the way that we get better at managing change, regardless of positive or negative, is to integrate the various parts of our lived experience and to understand, you know, how are they connected to each other and how are they um, impacting success or failure in any one dimension. So what I mean by that is, you know, the way we think, the way we feel, our um, our environments that we're in, our, our habits, you know, all of these things play off of each other. And for all of us, there's strengths in some and weaknesses in other. And so the opportunity there is to look at, you know, which of these dimensions am I strong in and which am I ignoring? Because the ones that we don't put attention to are likely to trip us up in any change process. Mm, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Well, so let's say that we've, we're going through the change process in our new job. <laughs> Right. One of the other things that we need to really be successful is to be adaptable, um, which I guess is really similar to being someone who can cope with change. Mm-hmm. From your perspective, I mean, is it the same the same reason in terms of why it's important to be adaptable? I mean, how does that kind of play into things? Yeah, I think I think that it is. I think that our you know our ability to adapt is you know our ability to to manage change and. You know, some of the some of the ways that prevent us from being adaptable are, you know, not not looking at like what are what are the elements that trigger us, right? And what are the stress responses that I have, and how can I more effectively manage those? You know, so for so for some people, a kind of one particular personality might really get under our skin, right? For other people, it might be um, it might be a quality like uh, perfection or uh, late or productivity or whatever it is. So really looking at our triggers is a super valuable way to, to build um, adaptability. And then again, looking at ourselves multidimensionally is super helpful. So one of the things that I think is, is really common culturally right now is that we have a, a really honed focus in, uh, you see a lot of, a lot of uh, content out there around like build your best habit or build your best, uh, you know, emotional self or, or fill in the blank, this kind of singular focus. And that's good, but the reality is, is that our habits alone, or our emotional selves alone, or our health and fitness alone, um, is only one kind of part of it of the entire lived experience, and is influenced by all these other parts. And so, an, an example of that would be, we could have a really great daily routine, right? We we could be eat, you know eating the protein shake in the morning, getting nine hours of sleep, exercising all you know every day, we're meditating. But if our emotional self is being ignored, when it comes to an emotional hurdle, our, abil- our ability to adapt is going to hugely suffer. And so, so that's the opportunity, again, is to look at which aspect of my life am I not giving enough attention to. Mm, I think that's really important. Mm-hmm. So say we're struggling with this and you know we're like, hey, I need some help. Like this is just not, <laughs> this is not working on my own. I need to get some other folks involved here. What types of external resources do you think we should consider if we find ourselves in a really stressful situation? Yeah, I think uh, professionally, you know, like I mentioned earlier, the tool of the 360, which is a feedback tool is, is really great. And a lot of organizations offer that as a, as a tool. And so I think that's one place to look. Um, uh, certainly, you know, professional coaching, and that could be a career coaching, or it could be coaching specific to uh, whatever that individual's developmental edge is, let's say. Um, and then of course, you know, therapy is an, is an option depending on what, um, the, the degree of which, uh, the person is dealing with, for instance, if it's, if it's something like a substance abuse or a trauma of some kind, you know, it might, might be better suited for therapy. And then things like, um, like mentoring, I think is a great option. Even forming a mastermind is mm. super helpful, you know, more of an informal scenario. So I think, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of tools out there. Those are good suggestions. You know, I've been thinking a lot lately about this topic of of resources. Um, there is an author that I really like uh, named Ruby Payne, and she was actually a guest on my show a long time ago. But she talks about different socioeconomic classes, and she talks about when you move up a class or down a class, like what happens. 
Mm. And one of the things that she really focuses on is resources that are available to you based on sort of the class that you were born into, right? Yeah. And she talks some, I actually just went to one of her workshops like a few weeks ago, which is why this is kind of fresh in my mind. Um, But she talks some about what it's like when you move up in socioeconomic class, right? Which personally, I can relate to this a lot. And when you go through a difficult situation, um, you know, and you don't have those resources, like say that you've gone from uh, poverty to middle class and in middle class, you know, it's expected that you should have a backup plan for who picks your kids up from school when they're sick during the day. Mm -hmm. But you don't have that backup plan because that's not something that was sort of available to you when you lived in poverty. And when you're in middle class and you're leaving your job at random to go to the children's school, like it becomes a problem. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's just a really interesting thing in my mind to sort of think about the resources that we do have available and sort of how to leverage those and sort of, I don't know, be being sort of aware of maybe where we need to reinforce things for ourselves, look, seek out resources that maybe don't exist today um, and that sort of thing. Yeah, that's, that's so interesting. And I, and I totally resonate with it. I'm you know, ba- based on various experiences I've had in my career working with um, folks that are, you know, in a, extreme poverty, low, very low socioeconomic status to working with, you know, leaders of organizations and kind of everything in between as far as access to resources go. I really appreciate you bringing that up because it's so true. Uh, The resources do change. And if, you know, if there is that lack of familiarity as you move up and down kind of this, this, this status rung, I suppose um, that can be, that can be a big challenge. So yeah, I think it's a really important note. Good, good. Well, this has been great. Where can we go to learn more about you and more about your work? So the, the best place would be uh, the website. You could find us at arcintegrated.com. That's A-R-C integrated.com. And then if you're interested in learning more about the book, uh, which is Changes is the title, uh, that's just thechangesbook.com. And folks can download a free chapter there and uh, a free toolkit, which helps walk through various exercises to help them uh, improve and work in life. Oh, that's great. Well, Michael, thank you so much for joining me today. This has been great. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. And thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed the episode today, please don't forget to help me out. Go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe to the show. The more subscribers we have, the easier it is for people to find the show. Thank you for listening to the Copeland Coaching Podcast today with your host, Angela Copeland. Tune in next time to get more great tips on turning your job search into a slam dunk.